Good evening, everybody. My name is Bert Dicht. I am Vice President of Membership of the National Space Society. And on behalf of my colleague, Larry Ahern, Vice President of Chapters, I'd like to welcome you to our Space Forum this evening. The space is a cool place for business. So again, thank you for joining us in this series of Space Forums and Town Halls. Uh, before I go forward, I would just like to do a shout out and sending our thoughts, prayers, best wishes uh, to all of our members in Florida that have been impacted by uh, Ian and all Floridians as well. It's been a, a terrible, devastating uh, hurricane and storm. So we're wishing them the best and uh, for a very speedy recovery and, and all the, again, all the people who've been impacted by this uh, terrible storm. So those of us, thank you for again for joining us. Uh, for this space forum, we'll do a little bit of our etiquette, go into just a few announcements, what's coming up in our space forums and town halls, and as always, we'll get into our program very fast. So if you are going to be submitting a question, we do encourage you to use the Q&A function. Uh, it can be seen but directly by the panelists. It's an easier way to filter out the questions. Uh, you are certainly welcome to use the chat to submit questions, uh, but we do have to go through those and, and, uh, and pull those out. But I ask everyone to be respectful of the panelists and the audience if you are submitting a question. We got a number of good questions that were submitted beforehand for those of you who registered, and uh, they've been sent to our moderator and panelists. So we do hope to address as many of those uh, as possible. Uh, as always, we would like to say if you're uh, supporting and enjoying these programs, uh, please consider making a donation to the National Space Society. Uh, the programming like this comes from your support as members and your generous donations. And as always, I will put the link into the chat uh, and we welcome any donations and thank you in advance for that. Uh, also at the end, please complete the uh, Space Forum survey. It only takes a couple of minutes. Uh, it is anonymous. You'll be put there as soon as we exit the uh, Space Forum. And your feedback has always been very helpful in helping us plan and execute these events. You'd be surprised how many great comments and suggestions we get. And that is good and bad. We welcome all the comments, things that we need to do better as well. So let's talk about what's coming up next with uh, the Space Forums. Uh, two weeks from tonight, we have astronaut Scott Altman. Uh, Scott was an F-14 pilot uh, before becoming a NASA astronaut, flew the space shuttle, commanded the shuttle, and he's doing a lot of work today in support of the space program, including uh, Artemis. Uh, by the way, if you saw the original Top Gun movie, uh, he was flying the F-14s in the original Top Gun movie. So he has a lot to talk about. On the 27th, we've got space artist James Vaughn. And if you are an avid reader of uh, Ad Astra, you have probably seen his great artwork, which has been on the cover many times. Uh, he's a renowned space artist, and he's going to be interviewed uh, by our very own Rod Pyle, the editor of uh, Ad Astra. On the 10th of November, we have the Students for Space Exploration and Development, SEDS. They're going to be coming live from their Space Vision Conference in Chicago, and they'll be talking about what students are interested in, uh, how they are making an impact uh, in, in space, and what they hope to see uh, coming forward. Larry and I are working on the rest of the schedule for 2022. Uh, we are probably going to have it, uh, definitely at least one more session, possibly two, uh, before the end of the year as we transition into 2023. And what I might do at one of our future space forums is uh, just share the statistics from all these. We've been doing this almost for two years now. We've got a lot of space forums and town halls under our belt. And I'll probably just share uh, kind of a, a status of how many we've done, how many attendees we've had, things like that, that you might find that interesting. So uh, I put this up the last time about looking for you know, your suggestions for speakers or topics. I did get a few good ones. Uh, so I decided to leave this up here again. And 
uh, let us know your ideas and we will start working on that. Larry and I, you know, we'll keep busy uh, and you don't have to do anything, any legwork. Uh, we can do all that as long as you give us some good suggestions or possibly some good leads. So very good, everybody. So what I want to do now is uh, I'm going to be introducing uh, our our moderator for this evening. So along with having probably one of the one of the uh, the best names of a, a space forum that we've had, uh, you know, I thought it'd be great to uh, just talk a little bit about uh, what's going on in this area now. NSS. Uh, we've been in a cooperative agreement with uh, what is called uh, GenSpace, the Global Entrepreneurship Network, uh, and how we can work better together. And Stefan uh, Recchi, who is our moderator this evening and is going to introduce our panel uh, and uh, guide us through the discussion. Uh, he is the executive director of GenSpace, has a long history of being involved in funding angel networks and uh, startups, and you're going to hear a lot more about this. There were a lot of questions that came in about how all of our panelists got started. So I'm sure they're going to be talking a little bit about that. So uh, it's my pleasure now to uh, turn the uh, session over to Stefan. And uh, Stefan, it is all yours. Oh, great. Thank you, Bert. Thanks. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Uh, and uh, thank you, especially Olivia, for joining us from uh, very rainy and wet uh, Florida. She's actually caught in the middle of the, the craziness now, so she's joining via phone. Um, I'm really excited to, to share our perspectives on space. And besides the fact it's cold, it's actually very cool for business. And you'll hear from my really good friends and panelists as to why. I think uh, to set the stage, I uh, thank you for my introduction. I wanted to have the panelists self-introduce themselves. So Olivia, if you can, um, can you give us a quick short intro of who you are, what you're currently doing, kind of uh, maybe feel free to just do a quick tagline of your company and uh, we'll, we'll go from there. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yes, I am down here at rainy Florida in the middle of Hurricane Ian. My company, Rhodium Scientific, is supporting a payload aboard Crew 5 launch. So that's pretty exciting. It's um, one of our, it's a scientific mission in partnership with Los Alamos National Laboratory and supported by the DOD. Um, my company, Rhodium, is one of the 13 commercial service providers to the International Space Station. And we do have strategic partnerships with multiple other laboratories, national laboratories as well within the United States. Uh, we support scientists and program managers nationally and internationally. And we, we focus on science first. We want to make sure that scientific experimentation and human health performance experimentation done in a microgravity environment is done with the same rigor and standards as is done in on the earth now for biopharma, biotech, pharmaceutical industries. So I am a microbiologist, um, trained engineer with a master in business. So it's kind of a unique background um, entering the space industry with a pedigree of 20 years in science and then another 20 years doing business. <laughs> so it's, it's really interesting, really fun. And this industry is uh, really booming. It's kind of at the cusp of um, being what the next gold rush was, you know, and so I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, thanks, Olivia. Uh, Brandon, I, you're, you're dialing in or zooming in from Washington State. Probably it's rainy on my side. Is it rainy on your side as well? I'm actually, I'm actually dialing in from Washington, D.C., so other oh, Washington, other coast other this Washington. week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm out, out here for a D.C. trip this week. Um, thanks for having us, Stefan. Uh, and NSS, thanks for having us here as well, too. Um, Brandon Seifert, I'm, I'm the business development lead at USNC or Ultra Safe Nuclear, um, specifically focused uh, on the company's space technology portfolio. Um, I guess a quick quick note about myself and what I do. My, my title is business development lead, so obviously business development, but at the end of the day, working for a, for a rapidly scaling uh, small business, no longer a startup now with the state of uh, maturity that we're at. Um, I'm really a growth strategist at the end of the day. Um, you know, a lot of what I really focus on is anything and everything that has to do with building relationships, generating revenue, storytelling, you know, communications and PR and things like that, um, managing investor relations, managing customer relations, uh, all of the things that are kind of necessary for stoking a business's growth and, and, and keeping that growth going. 
Um, UltraSafe Nuclear is, uh, is a Gen 4 advanced reactor company. So uh, for, for those of you out there that are familiar with uh, some of the, the, the hot stuff going on in nuclear right now, we're one of the small reactor, small modular reactor companies. And in fact, we're actually a micro modular reactor company, even, uh, even smaller physically in size and also in power output. We're talking, you know, five megawatts uh, electric output per reactor. And uh, it's a terrestrially focused company. Um, about 250 people, um, but we've got about a 50 person space division. So we take our fuel technology, our reactor technology for deploying on Earth and redesign it and repackage it and work with NASA and the DOD and some other folks to uh, figure out how to use these technologies for power and propulsion in space. And on, on top of that as well, too, uh, I'm a co-founder of GenSpace with Stefan going back to 2015, 2016. It's been a long time now, but, uh, but helped uh, Stefan to get this whole thing started. So excited to be here today. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, next, we have Oleshea. Oleshea, if you can hear us, you're dialing in from Lagos, uh, Nigeria, hopefully uh, not too early in the morning for you. Uh, if you can, just quickly introduce yourself and tell us a bit. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, and thanks for having me. Um, I'm Oleshea Shea Johnson. Um, I'm an ecosystem builder and innovation consultant um, with about a decade of uh, experience working and supporting the growing African space sector. Um, my interests are really um, accelerating the application of new technologies, um, not only space, across emerging markets uh, to help solve institutional challenges um, that have sort of plagued the continent for, for, for quite a while and drive you know, global participation of the continent. Um, I'm also committed to sort of looking at accelerate, accelerating um, capacity, um, looking at how we can grow the number of um, new space startups, um, not only downstream, which is the low hanging fruit for us as a continent, but also increasingly upstream. Um, and also you know, looking at uh, deploying um, more uh, space accelerators across key points um, um, in the um, African continent. As part of uh, GenSpace, um, I've been working to support um, several innovation programs um, across the continent that identify um, um, key players and try to support and um, create investment readiness um, for these uh, players to help them scale, right? Um, I'm the former regional partner at the Africa Technology Foundation, um, a Silicon Valley-based organization and um, a partner of the U.S. State Department um, working across several different um, projects over the last um, couple of years. So really, really excited to, to, uh, to be here and to, to speak with the panel. Thanks, Stefan. Thanks, Shaya. And Kali, would you like to say a couple of words and introduce yourself as well? Joining in from Los Angeles. Yeah, thank you, Stefan. Uh, happy to be here. Excited to uh, participate in this amazing panel. Uh, yeah, a little bit perhaps my uh, history first. So I, I'm a captain and co-founder of Space Nation, but uh, in the beginning, I'm a farmer's son from rural area from Finland in Nordics, even though living now in, in Los Angeles. And space was something that I remember uh, being innate for me since, since I was born. Uh, perhaps uh, watching the Star Trek uh, from the two TV channels that we had in the beginning of 80s was part of that or reading all the Asimov and sci-fi books. But uh, for me, it's, it's been always like another continent. Uh, growing up then uh, led me to study physics and actually like uh, listening to Brandon's like background, it was partly nuclear physics and, and theoretical physics. Uh, I went to military, special forces there as a trainer and ultimately also a private and public educator for about uh, uh, one decade. Uh, before it came with my good friend Mastak Nasir that uh, out of a coincidences and things that led, we uh, co-founded Space Nation. So it's almost uh, 10 years uh, coming and it's been a real uh, fascinating journey. What Space Nation uh, does is bringing the uh, adventure of astronauts to outer space, which in, in essence is a, a journey to our inner space available to all and creating simulated experiences here on Earth around that missions online, on site, where you actually can leave that future already. So whether it's on moon with the resource extraction and utilization or Mars Canyon cities or eventually the uh, Venus cloud cities, that you can really in simulated mission scenarios experience that. And of course, my passion 
for the space and everything that I've experienced is add, adds up to that kind of a scenario design from my background as an educator and from the military and, and, and innate space uh, fan. But about spa Space Nation, uh, we have also like this uh, virtual uh, spaceport community, spaceport.spacenation.org that you can uh, see and join for free and, and learn more. We are in this uh, uh, second iteration development mode there, but uh, you will get uh, all the knowledge of our experiences and what we do from there, of course. But yeah, I, I guess that's it. And uh, uh, eagerly waiting the, the questions and, and the discussions with the panel. Great. Well, thank you. And uh, thank you, panelists. And, and thank you, my friends, uh, panelists. So uh, just a quick thing about myself. So um, uh, executive director of Gen Space, and as Brandon mentioned, uh, came up with the idea in 2015, first announced it in uh, Istanbul, Turkey, at a, a global entrepreneurship network event. And the main uh, just behind Gen Space is to promote uh, universal entrepreneurship give anyone and everyone an ability to start a business in space, leverage best practices across borders across, and make it very inclusive. And also we, we spend a lot of time educating investors about space opportunities, as well as working with government agencies and academics to uh, inform them about the opportunities for space, uh, doing business in space. Uh, I personally am electrical engineer, moved from a high tech business uh, background to sales, and now I'm excited to be involved with a bunch of portfolio companies in space as well. So we have a couple of questions that we're, we're going to go through, and I know we have a lot of questions from the audience. So we're going to try to intersperse them, and I see that we lost Olivia uh, from Florida. So um, Alicia, Brandon, Kale, that means we're we're gonna we're gonna try to do as much as we can, and then if Olivia jumps in, I'll have her uh, come in. So my first question to you, and I'll start with you, Brandon. Um, what excites you about business opportunities for space or doing business in space? Uh, wide open, blank canvas, greenfield type um, type marketer type of opportunity. Uh, there's so many different things that need to be done from figuring out how to provide value for, you know, to where the people are today down on the surface of the earth and everywhere on the earth to figuring out how to um, do more in space. Um, you know, whether or not you're, you're a space for space business, a space for earth business and earth for space business. Um, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, there are some things that you can focus on that uh, directly impact lives today that directly address, you know, existing markets and existing business problems today. And there are some things that uh, you know play a role in like the critical infrastructure and like the you know the, the, the foundational type of stuff that will enable markets um, in space and enable a future in space where we do have people there and then you can have more businesses down the road. So um, I think what excites me the most about it right now is is how creatively open the market is today. That's great. Uh, Shaya, what about you? What, what excites you about opportunities for space business? Um, I think for me, it's really the the boldness, right, um, to to take on new challenges. Uh, I think you know, speaking from the from the context of uh, of Africa, um, you know, we've typically not um, participated, right, within the the commercial um, opportunities of of space, right. Um, so I'm I'm increasingly seeing um, more players uh, take on especially uh, downstream um, opportunities around Earth observation and really the power of, you know, that um, um, area of space to transform entire um, um, areas across the continent, right? Um, beyond just an altruistic uh, uh, um, perspective. Um, so whether it's, you know, uh, building out the $3 billion opportunity for agriculture in West Africa, right? Or whether it's looking at uh, climate change and and you know um, mapping drought um, 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 catastrophes across um, East Africa, um, or even um, looking at new areas uh, that are um, opening up um, resources like oil and gas and 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 uh, and mining, right? And utilizing the power of space for those. These are really critical things to help uplift um, um, new. Uh, uh, um, space economies um, across Africa. And I think, you know, just for me, it's the boldness, right? Um, to, to be able to um, take advantage of new capacity, take advantage of, you know, lower barriers um, of entry um, for in, in, into space um, and really looking at, you know, what is most um, applicable 
um, to the problems and to the you know um, localizing right um, the technologies to to um, the African nuances and emerging market nuances. So so that that for me and also um, the uh, the entry of players that are um, trying to do the important work of uh, of um, lowering the cost of 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 space data, right? So looking at um, space imagery and typically um, that high barrier of cost, right? Towards building things on top of that and building value on top of that, right? Um, I really see the the players that are trying to to um, consolidate and build um, new stacks on on on, on top of um, more established players, um, you know, and and um, reduce the cost uh, uh, as as a consequence of that. Um, I think that for me is is quite exciting and will open up ex exciting new um, um, areas for for um, new types of startups that can build on that. That's great, Shea. Your your energy is exciting and contagious. Let me tell you that for sure. So, um, Olivia, um, what, about, what about you? What excites you about uh, space opportunities? Well, I'm pretty much um, really interested in the scientific aspect that the microgravity environment lends to biology. And when I say that is, there's a lot of previous studies that show biology changes in space. And I think a lot of scientists in this, on the world, in America, on the earth, they don't know that. I mean, I'm a career scientist and I work with the top of the top scientists around the globe. And a lot of them are not aware, most of them are not aware of the capabilities and the unique environment that the microgravity, uh, that microgravity conducts and that what you can do in space. And so a couple of examples that really make me excited, um, there's previous studies on certain bacteria on earth, they cause skin infection. And the way that they look in the lab is gold, the color of the bacteria is gold. And then when it's exposed to the space environment, it grows in space, it's no longer causing infection, it's no longer pathogenic, and its color turns off to white. So is the gold implication of the pathogenicity of the organism? Why does microgravity turn this on and off? So that's really unique in terms of finding a new drug discovery, a new therapeutic. If we can subject every biological organism to the unique environment of microgravity and stress out that biology, and see how it changes. Can we change it for the better or change it for the worse? And so it's really, really exciting as a scientist um, to be doing a lot of these studies. Since 2020, my company, Rhodium Scientific, has sent up about 10 missions now, all looking at scientific biology. How does a human, um, some of the gut microbiome change in space? And what we're finding, what we're sending up on Crew 5, um, is our second mission with Los Alamos National Lab. But what we're looking at is isolating gut microbiome bacteria that on earth, they're, they're dormant. And then when we send it to space, they rise and we didn't even know they were there. And these, these pathogens inside the gut have a potential of increasing inflammation in the body. And when the body has inflammation, now you start a cascade of autoimmune and um, all different kinds of responses. And so is it really a space brain? Is it really implications of space affecting astronaut health? Or is it just a, a small, flip in the microbiome in the gut that we need to take a probiotic for before we go to space. And so this is these type of experiments that are really unique and we're really finding and constraining the, the results and the data so we can really isolate what are some of these issues and what are some of these beneficial therapeutics that can be derived from space. And that's, that's what I'm excited about is finding those discoveries, mining the cosmos for the next therapeutic. I loved your curiosity. Thank, thanks, Olivia. Thanks for sharing. And Kali, what about you? What what excites you about opportunities in space? Well, yeah, I, I loved when Olu Seyed talked about the boldness related to space exploration and going to space. And I think that's a very key thing and a driver behind everything. So that kind of a pioneer spirit and like exp uh, driving the exploration. And, and we can draw the line and I love like history and, and putting, in, putting our expansion to space in a broader context. So starting from like when we first ventured out from Africa and explored every corner on earth, we can jump into the settlers of the new world and now going to space and doing 
the same as similar, but of course, like learning from past lessons and so forth. So I'm very excited about the impact that our humanities expansion to the moon and Mars and beyond, how that affects us uh, as a species, as individuals, as collective uh, minds, uh, our consciousness, how it lifts our perspectives as it has in the history in all these circumstances. And I believe strongly and innately that it, it's for the better ultimately. And, and the faster we get that done and going to that direction, the better. And it is natural. It, it is something that if we fight against that, it's fighting against our nature that has been forced for billions uh, or millions of years uh, as a species. And the explosion of opportunities then related to that, of which part like space nation is, is one part, but happening uh, past 10 years, let's say, like an explosion, basically, uh, that's very, very uh, interesting and, and exhilarating. And if talking uh, some part of that, uh, uh, it's, uh, for example, the self-sustaining habitats and every technology related to that and what we can learn from that to bring here downstream on Earth uh, to become those stewards of Earth and life uh, and, and planetary like uh, management that we can learn from that. And of course, uh, regarding my own uh, personal background, so the farming and, and soil issues and, and food production is very close to heart, especially thinking how we do that in space and what we can learn uh, uh, from that and innovate to bring here down on earth, which is a very, very important thing uh, re related to climate change and, and uh, uh, building our civilizations in the future here. So maybe that's that's a one answer for that. That that's great. Thank th thanks, Kali. Um, Brandon, uh, in addition to what you do, what's the coolest thing you can think of, or most impactful thing you can think of, uh, program that's going on in the space business right now? Yeah. So uh, one of the things that I'm the most excited about right now is how we're seeing this. Um, next generation of like digitization um, and communication infrastructure and data infrastructure. Um, the, the only businesses uh, that have successfully commercialized in Earth orbit stayed successful. I mean, of course, you know, individual companies have gone up and down, but the, the, the only businesses or services that have really, you know, kind of stood the test of time um, in, in the space market have been telco telecommunications and, and information and data relay services. Um, and you're now starting to see huge companies that have historically not been space companies in any way, shape or form at all, um, move into that space in huge ways. Um, companies like Apple, um, companies like uh, T-Mobile, um, partnering up with, with SpaceX. Um, you know, the list goes on, but it's exciting to see how space technologies and capabilities have become so robust and trustworthy that you have these companies that know nothing about space agreeing to you know, fold them into their business model. It's exciting seeing how these companies that have successfully globalized their services um, are now going to you know, further enhance their service through space. Um, so you're, you're not seeing these small little niche applications of, of space value. You're not seeing you know, just a, a small population or you know, uh, you know, a certain certain part of the world um, benefit in particular, you're going to see everybody everywhere start to benefit from it. Um, and again, what's cool is that this is happening in a sustainable business model. It's not a one-off mission. It's not, you know, a 10-year scientific research project. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real deal industry. Uh, so that's that's what I'm, I'm super excited about. Great, thanks. Shay, what about you? What, what, what excites you? Um... What, sorry, what, what is the coolest thing, the most impactful thing, besides what you do, that you can share with the audience? Um, I mean, I think there's, there's several things, right? If we're looking globally at, uh, you know, what's cool, right, um, and, and really what has impact. Um, as I mentioned before, um, you know, there's, there's a proliferation of, you know, startups that are trying to take on um, the, the really important task of making you know, Earth observation data more accessible, so democratizing um, access to to um, to space uh, uh, imagery data. Um, this has historically been super super expensive. Um, 
So, you know, it, it, it has limited a lot of times um, the use of this, of the data, you know, to, you know, governments, um, you know, who maybe want to use it for security. Um, but, you know, it, it, it sort of stifled what's possible on top of that when you are able to use, say, um, artificial intelligence, um, you know, for precision agriculture and, and have a startup that has the capabilities to, to, to build that um, and needs to access the, the, the data. Um, you know, that's, that's innovation that's waiting to happen that has not historically been able to happen because of that. So, you know, um, just seeing, you know, the, uh, the, um, that interest, right, to sort of lower that barrier, um, I think lots of really, really cool things are, are going to happen from that, right, um, that are going to target you know, new markets, um, whether it's, it's emerging markets like, like Africa, Latin America, um, or, you know, more established markets, um, and just, you know, um, ensuring that, you know, new types of things can be built on top of that. Um, in terms of other areas that I'm interested in, um, you know, I mean, globally would be a spin launch, right? I have to say that is one of the coolest things that, um, that I've been 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 tracking, um, and and the reason for that is you know uh, a couple of years ago uh, when I mean on a trip to to Cork Island right um, to to speak at uh, the International Space University, um, you know I was just thinking how you know what's possible right with being able to get payloads into space um, without rockets right. Um, and and how does that impact what's then possible to put into space for all sorts of of um, of economies? And you know to to see that kind of um, idea um, take on a life at, of of its own and start accelerating. Um, you know I think I want to see more of that kind of innovation. Um, there are certain players that have started looking at you know, um, building things like that uh, and, and um, spaceports out of new locations like, like Africa, say like Kenya, right? Maybe that have less regulations around launch, um, you know, just to, to, to sort of shake up um, 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 the, the transportation aspect of space, right? So it'd be really cool to see more things like that, um, I think. Great, thanks. Um, Olivia, what about you? What, what's, what's the coolest thing you can think of? I think right now it's really cool going on in the space industry is some of the uh, new programs and projects that um, NASA is spearheading that some of the commercial companies are spearheading um, shameless pitch um, rhodium scientific my company is really involved in a biomanufacturing program and that's important because when you're talking about long term strategy when you're talking about long term travel. Um, you can't take a whole boatload of suitcases. You can't take crates and crates of stuff you can load on a ship or put in a truck. You have to be really um, smart about your logistics and your, your supply chain. And so being able to biomanufacture or manufacture what you need at the source um, by taking a vial of cells, adding some water when you get there, and boom, you have your vitamin or you have your therapeutic or you have your food. That's more useful technology and innovative. And that's a big push right now within the DOD, within NASA, within the commercial industry, just with synthetic biology coming online right now and finding more useful, innovative ways to make a end product um, without going through the traditional supply chain. So biomanufacturing is a, a really cool thing going on right now. It's a cool program, cool project, cool, um, new focus in the United States and abroad. And, and the second thing I'd say is really cool and a good program going on is the CDFF program. That's the Commercial Destination uh, Free Flower Program, where this program is breeding what we saw back in the day with Apollo between US and Russia and who's gonna get to the moon first. This CDFF program is breeding competition within the United States, again, with commercial companies looking to build their own private space station. And so we've all heard that the space station is gonna retire. Um, when that happens, the idea is to transition the current science, the current technologies to open up for manufacturing in space, biomanufacturing in space, um, having um, 
fueling destinations and depots. And these commercial privately owned space stations are supposed to serve that purpose. And so it's really cool right now seeing the competition and all the innovation that it's breeding and seeing scientists and engineers and architects and hotel chains coming together to start visualizing the concept of living and working in space. So that's that's what's cool to me. Thanks, Olivia. And Kali, what, what are your what, what are your cool thoughts about space? I I, I could start like like Brandon. Uh, brought a good point like talking about self self-sustaining like business models in space and how rare they are and those are definitely always for me interest like that I want to see more and I'm happy when I see like pioneers on that whether they are ventures programs uh, that uh, help uh, the outcome of that will be self-sustaining businesses whether it's in low earth orbit or beyond and that basically comes to another like if I talk like concrete programs I mentioned two, but I view them as one. So if we take like a bird view from Earth and seeing a moon, uh, both uh, uh, there, maybe a bird in a spacesuit, but uh, uh, in, the, in the low Earth orbit, uh, what Olivia was pointing to, seeing this private space station, I would highlight there the Axiom space uh, uh, station, not just because it's a space nation partner also, but because it's, uh, I've had the privilege to like see that program and venture mature, and that uh, is something solid uh, on a very solid ground uh, with the business model wise, and and something that is being built already and and happening. So that's one part that seeing that low Earth orbit uh, business economy happen also in human space flight, but other like manufacturing, like Olivia mentioned, and space hotels and so forth. And as the plan is that then is the governmental resources. Okay, government like NASA is like a client of like a customer to Axiom Space and other providers on low Earth orbit, but it releases some of those resources to go beyond what is then happening there on the moon. And that relates to Artemis program and everything part of that uh, uh, perhaps highlighting, of course, like SpaceX and the HL, HSL and, and the Starship projects, but also other things and robotic missions that are built around that, which spearheads then our next stop, which is creating that cislunar economy. So these are kind of a, that doing this in sustainable, self-sustaining way and, and something that will be outcome, not just visiting there and and learning of that moon, uh, cislunar economy, and ultimately then the next stop being Mars and, and building a, a private also business self-sustaining ecosystem around moon. These are something that very much I, I view as a highly impactful and, and in the long term. There might be many things that in the short term are more impactful now and, and talking how we use Earth observational things and everything, but I'm, as I said, like very uh, uh, look like the whole humanity and what it looks like 50 years from now, 100 years old and, and beyond, and what is important for that. And I cannot emphasize the importance of this project like Axiom Space or the Artemis program doing government and, and private sector together and, and how that goes into phases that uh, uh, they they succeed and, and that goes forward. So yeah, that's that's where my, my coolest take is. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Kai. Thank you. Thank you, panelists, for sharing your coolness. Um, Olivia, you're dialing in, so you can't see the questions coming in, but there's two questions that I think you can just quickly answer. Um, the first one, are you aware of plans for a, a private hospital in space to, to leverage microgravity to slow things like the growth of tumors, or is it still cheaper to build a microgravity environment on Earth? That's a very unique concept. Um, so right now, there are, that I know of and I'm aware of, I am not aware of a private hospital being built in microgravity. However, I do know that there's a lot of work being done on the earth to build up and booster the supply kits, the emergency medical kits that are being used in space. One of the common issues that we've heard and, and we're experienced with, with the human health performance, with the medical kits, some of the antibiotics, some of the medications are not as efficient as they are in space versus when the how they perform on earth. And we ask, why is that? With some of the new data coming out, 
we thought maybe, okay, it's radiation, maybe the antibiotics, maybe the medication is losing its potency, its efficiency in space. But now we're finding that maybe it's just, it's not effective in space because the gut microbiomes and other human systems within the body are changing and less uh, receptive to that medication when the body is put under the stress of microgravity. So it's a, a chicken and an egg, you know? So do we boost up the, the medication kits or do we boost up the human body? Uh, so we're still on the, the ground line of finding which is it, you know, what are the changes happening within the, when, inside the human and what are the changes happening to the materials we send up? Um, okay. oh, sorry. <laughs> absolutely. That's it. Uh, and yeah. So that question was for Janine. Another one for you real quick, uh, because you can't see the screen uh, is from Carl. How successful is stem cell development in microgravity? That's a really interesting point. And it actually has been shown to be very successful in microgravity, so much so that it might be worth conducting more stem cell research and actually develop it, development in the microgravity realm. The reason is because when you're comparing a study that's done exactly on Earth to a study that's done in, in space, we're seeing in space that stem cells differentiate and proliferate faster. And what that means is a stem cell becomes its, um, its stem cell gets its unique capabilities quicker in space, and then it multiplies faster in space. Is that because it doesn't have the pressure or, or the force of gravity on it, and these little organisms are able to be more efficient in a free floating environment? That's what we're thinking. But the scaffolding structures, when you're thinking about building tissues and organs in space, you're able to really build a um, strong scaffold in the microgravity environment because you can start layering layers of tissues on top of each other, building up this organ more efficiently in microgravity than you can on Earth. So it's a very, very hot topic right now. A lot of research and funding is going into it, and especially in the microgravity environment. Thank, thanks, Olivia. Um, this question also came in. Um, this is to everyone, and feel free to jump in, whoever wants to jump in first. Who of you, uh, who on the panel plans to go to space to conduct business? Is there any any push for anyone to, to jump into a, a space suit or a spaceship anytime soon? I, I don't have any plans for it personally or professionally, uh, but I can definitely say that I want to do it. I would love to do that. I would love to be in a position where the market you know, requires that type of in-person activity in space. Um, if, if I had the opportunity to, to, to trade my career to be a, a nuclear reactor operator and, and go run a, run a reactor on the surface of the moon, hell yeah, sign me up. I would love that. But uh, no, currently no official plans for that type of thing. Okay, anyone else? Anybody been on a zero G yeah, flight? Could, yeah, I, I could say that. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I've actually like been on the zero G flight, like in in uh, uh, Star City in, near Moscow, like some years back, and uh, with the so-called original vomit comet. And and uh, I highly recommend anyone on the call like uh, uh, to go on the zero G flight, like if, if you haven't yet. That it's something that uh, when you first time experience it, you you'll never forget it. Uh, so I don't forget like going like a ping pong ball in the hall there like uh, uh, first time. Uh, and yeah, planning to go to space and, and that, but no official plans in that sense, like not knowing when. And I don't want it to be like a tourist trip, just that if, if I go to space, as few have the kind of a opportunity and privilege to go, then uh, you kind of might take is that you need to, of course, do something meaningful there, uh, whether it's research or, or something else. Uh, and, and somehow I feel that uh, I'm sure that I'll have the opportunity if I really, really want to go there and do something in the future, uh, whether it happens some years from now, whether it happens 10 years or 20 years from now, who knows, but we'll see. Great, thanks. Anyone else? Yeah, just a quick comment. They really need to bring back, and I, if if I have my way of rhodium and the scientists um, doing work in microgravity, we'd like to bring back the mission scientists, the payload specialist roles that they had back in the shuttle days. And what that role is, is someone who is a scientist trained, that's their, their background. Uh, traditionally, a lot of the astronauts have engineering or um, aerospace or their Yes, they're, they're flight pilots and they've never stepped foot in a laboratory before, but they're handling all of the, you know, the most important and expensive ex world experiments going on the space station. And so uh, having a capable person who is 
um, knows the background of science and knows how to manipulate and work with science and use, you know, clean techniques. Um, like astronaut Kate Rubin, she is a scientist and she did phenomenal on our payloads. But that is, is certainly something we need to think about when we're talking about having maybe a hospital in space, um, having, you know, more tourists in space with different types of backgrounds and health conditions. You really need trained scientists up there to do the experiments and, and provide the health care. Great, thanks. Shea, any, any comments about desires for going up to space? Um, yeah, that's that's an interesting one, right? Um, you've you've only had like a handful of of Africans going to space, right? Um, so I I mean I come from the point of view of you know not just diversity, right? But you know having having diverse um, voices, right? In in participate in that conversation about what's possible um, in space, and so you know just being able to take advantage of um, of programs that allow more people to to access and, and be part of that, right? Those are kind of things that I've been thinking about lately. Um, I was uh, uh, speaking to uh, some some of the the, the guys that are behind uh, who want to be an astronaut, right? Right with um, the reality uh, type uh, show that that Axiom um, um, is 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 planning um, a few years ago. And, um, you know, I, I, I sort of, I sort of thought about that as an interesting way, maybe to open up, um, access, uh, maybe a fun way, I would say to open up access to, to, to maybe, um, some new African, um, astronauts. Um, I would say I would love it to be me, but most likely, you know, it'll be one of our, um, exciting, um, um, uh, a scientist on the continent, and for me, that that would be really, really great to see. So more African representation um, um, in space. I think. Great, thanks. Um, and uh, if if I if I if I can add like a shameless like promotion in that sense that uh, in at Space Nation we are like building our universal citizen space program that has those simulated missions and expeditions online and on site. But we have also like plans by 2025 to send like first people through the program in space, also starting from suborbital flights to the orbit. And part of those programs, of course, are zero G flights uh, too with with partners. So uh, that's uh, something that is on the, our pipeline, and we have some experience on that in 20, 2018 we were doing. But like as all all know, like suborbital flights began like last year so we were a little bit earlier at that time with our astronaut training up but uh, there's more accessibility for that happening uh, now whether it's through us or, or other ventures and organizations and that's really exciting that not just uh, let's say millionaires or wealthy people but like there's ways to get like uh, also uh, affordable ways so by performance meritocratically let's say Thanks. Thanks, Kali. Um, as I was saying, there's, there's, there's a lot of questions here, and I'm trying to make one general big encompassing question that we're going to try to answer in a short uh, period of time. So um, a lot of the questions talk about what do you recommend for college grads interested in starting up a space business? How can people get involved? Um, how can uh, inventions or ideas get marketed to the space community? Um, maybe uh, as we go through uh, with you guys, uh, what advice would you share with the audience if someone in the audience would like to get involved in a career in space, or maybe uh, anecdotally talk about how you got started? Um, we have about half an hour left, and I don't want to take half an hour answering that question. I know we could spend probably hours answering that question each. If you can take a couple of minutes each and, and, and really highlight your key uh, advice points with the audience about doing business in space, how they can get involved how you can get started. So let me uh, change the order around. Uh, Kali, uh, let me let me jump to you first. Sure, and it's good that you said that a certain time limit because like uh, there's, there's, there's a lot, so don't hesitate there, anyone to contact me if, if, if you want to talk talk more about entrepreneurship and space ent uh, entrepreneurship. But uh, yeah, a few points perhaps that, uh, well, for, for it, First, uh, it's great that you're here. So that's a great step already. And, and joining uh, communities and, and having experiences around space. So for National Space Society is a, is a good start. 
uh, becoming a member uh, of course space uh, nation and, and perhaps like taking some of our experiences uh, learning about the ecosystem some of you may be well invested in those already but if there's new one that's of course the first step uh, another point I would say that having a patience of course like space venture depends of course what you do but like as in all entrepreneurship in entrepreneurship perhaps especially um, things don't don't go as fast as you usually think they will go so being prepared to be for the long haul in there and be very early to go out there with your ideas your ventures uh, and i would say that if you're grad students like perhaps like first like uh, make sure that you have different kind of jobs and experiences from there and draw everything that you can take from there so i've been a uh, 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 in student times and that like a moving moving man and a janitor and I learned a lot about humans and logistics and things from that those that I use at my work today so everything you that you've done in your life draw lessons learned from there uh, but go out there tell your story tell your idea take the feedback um, and be believe in uh, show that you believe or do what you believe basically be kind, grateful. And if you do that and in a way that uh, you have good intentions, of course, and, and you are there for uh, uh, helping others, creating impact, it'll be a message that resonates ultimately. And you find the right people when you uh, go out there more and, and you find uh, the opportunities and doors opening for you. So kind of like in maybe a short and that, that planning is cozy and comfortable, uh, but ultimately you need to get out there and put yourself on, on the line. Uh, maybe a last point that um, um, get mentors and advisors that guide you on your journey. And it's the same as with investors, uh, 95 to 99 po percent of mentors, advisors are probably a wrong fit for you. But find that one in 10 or one in 100 that is a good fit. Uh, it's about quality, not the quantity. And also, during your venture as an entrepreneur, entrepreneur, uh, usually there are like friends. Some some stay for the whole way and can uh, help you and, and mentor and advise. But there are also specific mentors, advisors for certain periods, uh, growth growth times of your venture uh, that makes sense. But may, maybe those. I, I have some more, but like uh, let's get some others to talk also. Thank Thanks, you. Kali, for being respectful for the time. I agree with you. This 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 question could be answered with hours. And and one thing I want to note is, please, everyone on the audience, please feel free to reach out to us, uh, ideally through LinkedIn. If you do do that, please do mention that you heard us uh, during this webinar, and we'd be happy to answer uh, questions as well offline. Um, let's see, Olivia, what 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 what, do you, what kind of advice would you share with the audience? Well, there's. There's two thoughts of mine. If you're going to start a business in space, and if you want to enter as a part as a professional, so I, I would think my first advice: if you're going to enter into any business, um, being even from a technical background, it's important because what they don't do in the university or, or collegiate level is really cross train um, disciplines. What I mean by that is, if you're an engineer, or scientist, or IT data. Um, Take it upon yourself to take some electives and take some courses in the business management area. Um, if you can do that officially and get credit, do that. But if not, take it upon yourself to train yourself in the areas of business. Um, the particular areas would be you know, finance for executives, which is a high level um, overview of how finances and how to look at you know, the books. How to, how to do your books, how to look at books, how to look at other people's books, other companies. And do a few, um, Harvard Business Review has a lot of good information on case studies, why comparing and contrasting successful businesses versus failures, um, what case studies on IBM, um, high-tech industries, what made them successful, but also what made them fail. And also looking in a course that is training and managing um, or working with a, tech, a technical team, a high performing team. So in the space industry, you're gonna find yourself surrounded by a lot of high performers, a lot of technical performers and being able to manage them and knowing what they 
what motivates an engineer or a scientist is different than what motivates, um, say, a stockbroker. Um, what motivates technical folks is peer review and kudos in front of for them in front of their peers. So when you give them acknowledgement, that motivates a high performing team. And if you ask them, do you want praise in front of the whole company or do you want a hundred dollars? They're gonna take the praise in front of the whole company. And so knowing what motivates those style of people would be really helpful in business and working in the space industry, but also in any business that you wanna start. But within the space industry, getting into this sector, um, I was really a little bit naive on how high the learning curve was. Um, when I founded Rhodium in 2014, we had a successful past of, managing and operating a lot of different laboratories across the United States and working with scientists across the United States. And I said, oh, the ISS is another laboratory. It's just, you know, located kind of differently. And that was a definitely an understatement in realizing the policies and procedures that really go into and the politics that go into getting into the space arena. It's a very small knit community. Um, don't burn any bridges because you're probably going to be working with that person in another company in about six months. So <laughs> that's kind of my biggest advice. Just be helpful, do your work and do it as fast as you can and, and get it right. Because we don't, you know, we really don't have time to in the commercial now that it's turning over to a commercial world um results are going to be expected thanks olivia um how about brandon mm -hmm. what about you what, what, what do you think yeah so so just to set some context here real quick a, a quick note about myself um so uh i got started uh, on the space sciences side uh, my degree was in astrophysics but i always loved the business of space it was always about the business of space and advanced technology so Made sure I passed my classes, did well in school, but all of my time was spent volunteering or interning or going to events or uh, cross training a little bit, going to, you know, sitting in on other classes, figuring out, you know, what, what seminars or lectures were happening in what other buildings and just going and sitting, um, talking with a lot of mentors and advisors. So I, I studied space sciences, but I lived and breathed space business. Um, and over the course of my career, uh, I've been the first employee, the 10th employee, the, you know, multiple the n tenth employee um i've i've been uh, a co-founder um i've been an advisor uh, i've worked with investors doing diligence figuring out how to you know deploy their capital i've worked with startups trying to figure out how to raise capital and how to navigate you know having diligence done on them um i've, I've helped companies navigate crisis modes i've been all over the place with with a variety of different space startups at different maturities um and, and in different parts of the world uh and so from that perspective, um, I, I, I answer the question with a question. Um, it's, it's less about, you know, what advice you have, you know, how do I get started? Um, the first thing that, that I would ask, um, if you know, we were, we were having this conversation privately is, you know, after what's your business idea? Um, it's okay, are you launching this business? Are you launching this venture? because you have a neat technology, because you have a cool idea, because, you know, there's something that you want to be able to say that you're working on, because you think that there's something that could be a cool, neat story. And you're then going to figure out how to apply that to a market. You're, you, you've got a solution and you're looking for a problem to apply it to. Or are you building your business around a problem that exists that you've already identified? And now you're going to work with your team to figure out how to build a solution to that problem. Uh, and then capitalize on that. Because if you're going into here with a solution already pre-made and you don't really have a clear idea of what problem you're trying to solve or what market opportunity there is or whether or not your customers even exist and if they do exist, do they have money to purchase your solution? Um, that's that's, a, that's a, a common and recurring theme, I think, in the space industry is that there are a lot of people that come out with these super cool ideas, really exciting things, fascinating technologies, and they you know wanna, they wanna get paid to, to try to you know, push that and commercialize that but they never did the homework to figure out whether or not you could actually productize that. Is there a customer out there that will buy it? Is the problem real? And is it so severe that people are desperately looking for a solution? Um, so be honest with yourself about that dynamic as you think about your business and your business idea or your startup idea before you do that. Um, and, and be honest with yourself about, you know, what's got you excited about this opportunity in the first place. Do you really want to go solve, solve a problem that you can monetize? Or is this just kind of a fun, exciting, ego-driven thing for you? And, and think about how that'll play out. 
Thanks, Brandon. And, and uh, let's see, Shaya, what, what are your thoughts? What, what, what advice can you share about space business for someone that's looking at getting involved in it? Um, I would say that, you know, just to add to, to what's been said already, right, um, that there are several, um, you know, programs, um, you know, catapult type um, programs, I, you know, if I think um, towards uh, the, the big uh, um, um, uh, business innovation centers across Europe that were set up to sort of get more people um, from non-space sector type activities into space. Um, so really coupling, you know, the great research that's coming out of universities with, you know, the entrepreneurial spirit of, you know, um, of, uh, of entrepreneurs, right? Um, and, and being able to bring those together, right? Uh, there's a synergy that comes um, um, from that that really helps the entire ecosystem. So, you know, when you have those kind of programs um, that are actively seeking to take people who are interested, but non-space um, professionals and couple that with, with space opportunities, I think those are things that can be um, taken advantage of. Um, this summer, we uh, worked closely with uh, about, I, I believe, 30 uh, uh, individuals um, as part of the European Institute of Innovation for Sustainability's uh, Space Entrepreneurship Program. This was the maiden um, um, uh, program right this year and they had diverse skill sets right from across the world from the u.s from europe from um, um different different markets um and a lot of non-space uh, uh entrepreneurs looking to come together um for a couple of months really learn immerse themselves and then come out with you know space startups and i think that's something that potentially can be taken advantage of i'm looking for for, for some of these um, I would also say, you know, um, it's it's really about curiosity, right? Um, I came from the ecosystem building side of things um, in the wider technology um, um, sector, and I saw the opportunity to, you know, shift people uh, and myself as well towards, you know, lower hanging fruit within the um, space sector. So, you know, earth observation, building on top of earth observation type data, right? Which means that you're not building very complex uh, systems that are going to space. Rather, you're building on top of, you're building solutions to really important problems on top of, you know, space data. And we're seeing a lot of, a lot of really great companies doing that right now. Um, so so that's, that's, that's really what I would say. Um, you know, look for that low-hanging fruit um, um, as, as an entry point and then push, push forward. As, you know, Brandon had mentioned in terms of, you know, just doggedly um, um, picking up everything that you can, whether it's the internships and it's the you know, um, anything that really gets you closer to what you, you want to do in space. That, that, that's great advice. Um, one of the questions came up is, what are some of the assumptions, or what's what's an assumption that you made before starting in the space business that has changed after working in the space business? Um, feel free, whoever wants to jump in to answer that, just unmute yourselves. Tough question. I can, I, can, I can start the answer. <laughs> get get Brent. Um, so when I when I first started breaking into the space industry, um, I think one of the uh, one of the assumptions that I had was that um, a deep space market existed. Uh, there are businesses operating in space, doing things in space, you know, using space assets to generate value and to generate revenue. But they aren't space for space businesses. They aren't anywhere beyond Earth orbit. Um, all of everything they're doing is focused back down on Earth. It's space for Earth. Um, and it doesn't seem particularly sexy now, you know, from the perspective that we currently have looking at all sorts of, you know, different cool technologies and ideas and concepts for a lot of, you know, deeper space businesses. Um, but you know, space is a place to do business and it's a very cool place to do business. Um, but, you know, it, it was, it was, it was difficult learning over the course of my career, kind of breaking that, that first, you know, big passionate idea that I had, um, learning that the space market doesn't necessarily exist yet. Um, there aren't uh, companies in space exchanging cash for services on orbit quite yet. There are a lot of companies that are very near to, you know, being able to do that. And a lot of companies that are starting to shake hands with each other. Um, you know, I think that we might be on the precipice of that. And I would love to see that, you know, become reality. 
Um, but that, to answer your question, that was an assumption that, uh, that, I, that I had to learn how to break. Um, and then, of course, you know, the, the next step or thought after that was, okay, well, now that I've learned this, what can I do about changing that? You know, how, can, how can I be a part of re-expanding that or going out and, and, you know, making that original romantic assumption that I had uh, a reality? Great. Thanks, Brandon. Anyone else? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd like to jump in. Um, really, the timelines associated with space. I had always um, heard space is hard, um, space is expensive, it takes forever. Um, it's basically not worth going if you're a commercial company because you know companies are bought and sold in the time it takes to get to launch. But upon entering the industry and knowing that those are some of the barriers um, for new companies, new, new performers to come into the market, I started looking for ways to circumvent those old walls, those old stereotypes, and where, where can we streamline this process? Where can we improve it? And what I found was, yes, it was a steep learning curve for, for my company um, for two years. But once we got the right agreements in place, we were able to launch a project from kickoff to launch in six months. And we've repeatedly done that since 2020. Um, five missions in 2020, six in 2021. Uh, we're, we're doing um, a couple this year. We're slated on every single launch, the next five launches, and they're all already ready to go and ready to be kicked off. And we're doing it at the speed of business. So it's kind of unusual that you know, I thought it was going to be hard to do, and we've seen a lot of pushback in, in, you know, from some of the traditional ways NASA formally operates or currently operates, and they're changing their mindset, and it's been really cool to see the change from a totally government-run independent agency to an agency that's relying on the commercial performers to start filling in the gaps, and so that's been a, a unique a unique perspective to see the change from kind of old school to new school and that it is being done at a lot more um, inexpensive rates. I know that Rhodium's rates compared to some of our um, other competitors and other commercial service providers, uh, you know, they're, some of their rates are four times higher than ours to do the exact same thing and we're getting in six months and they're still giving you a one to three timeline. And so it's just interesting that you've got to innovate to compete. And within this new market, you know, they're really room for those who want to compete and those who want to be fast and want to operate at the speed of business. Great. Thanks, Olivia. A anyone else, Kali, you wanted to say something? Yeah, yeah, I was. And, and actually, now that Olivia mentioned, like, yeah, timing, I can agree also, like, this timelines that, uh, although we were aware of, like, that these usually in space business launches and, and suborbitals and developments like there's always like setbacks and that sort of stuff but we were aiming that 2018 2019 there would be suborbital flights and we needed to make tough choices because it didn't happen at the time and that perhaps like uh, reminds me that uh, my understanding from the vast research of successful startups and and unicorns and such the Singular, the most important aspect. Of course, there's many, many, many factors, uh, but has always been timing, like afterwards. But that's the thing that it's hard to like know in advance. You are making a best bet with very limited information, uh, and perhaps the only way to prepare is that that okay, you can prepare that. What if the time timing is off? Can I do some kind of a sustainable revenue and business alongside so that tag along longer until the timing is right? Basically, if you are like too early of course if you're too late then that's probably like gone the opportunity there might be but rarely also like in business like the first pioneers or those inventors do the real money it might be the second comer that learns from the mistakes of the first one for example not to undervalue the importance of being first in that sense but the other that came into my mind was secrecy and perhaps it's not like space business oriented so much but it is usually for a common mistake in entrepreneurship that we were uh, i and my co-founder very like secretive of our ideas and things in the beginning and that's the opposite of like what i said like go out there and talk your story and solutions and these kind of things uh, of course that depends a little bit what you do if you have like rocket engine inventions or something you don't show off like the uh, uh, picture, like uh, everything from that, like how you construct and that sort of stuff. 
But I do think that in many cases in entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship, people are too much hiding behind perhaps like IPs or even patents uh, and forgetting that the real sustainable business and long-term success comes from building that motivated organization and finding those handle like the people's motivations like Olivia was talking and that effective organization that has greater rate of in innovation as saying very abstract terms than, than the competitors. And that's a long-term like my belief that uh, very undervalued competitive edge rather than hiding behind IPs and, and uh, hiding behind patents will, which will uh, ultimately be obsolete the, or they can be even copied the solutions ultimately, but try to copy organizational culture or an effective organization. Big corporations have many times tried to do that uh, when they see like small agile startups doing great things on that sense and basically never works. So build a great organization, a company that can execute and that's your competitive edge rather than like uh, secrets or IPs and, and, and patents, which of course, some cases you need to have, but they can't be the driving force. And, and you're hitting on a, a, one of the key areas for gen space is, is alleviating this whole space race to make it all collaborative. I mean, yeah, there are certain governmental restrictions like ITAR, but it's really the best practices of entrepreneurship. It's how do you make that company successful? Like, like Brandon was saying, talk to customers, making sure that you have financing available. Shaya, what about you? Um, what, what are your thoughts? Um, I mean, I think uh, for me, right, there are a lot of assumptions, assumptions um, that you can make uh, coming from from you know an emerging space uh, ecosystem, right? That's quite far behind, right? And I think maybe the um, the the one assumption that I had right was that there might be no way to sort of you know um, accelerate or or catch up right uh, in terms of you know um, an ecosystem like 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 ours that's 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 really left um, the the space ecosystem uh, uh, space innovation um, um, conversation quite late right um, but. Over the, over the last couple of years, right, I'm talking to to um, um, leaders in this space in terms of you know policy and and programs that have been put out there, right. Um, you know, I'm just seeing. I, I'll take maybe the um, the UK government's um, um, satellite applications catapult, right. So being able to to institute um, uh, catapults like that, right, that see the the gap in 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 um in in this case with, with the uk seeing how far behind it was in terms of really driving domestic um capacity within that space right and saying what do we now do about it to to, to catch up how do we connect what's happening with universities with the larger um, um uh, uh space industry or entrepreneurial aspect of it um and improve the ability of uk's industry to commercialize the outputs that that, that are needed um I think that that program for me um, just maybe creates like a spotlight or, or like a torchlight, right? Um, in terms of a direction um, and getting the right stakeholders uh, in place, um, you know, to, to then help catapult, right? Um, emerging ecosystems forward, really to create their own unique value, right? And, 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 and come from their own unique uh, uh, problem sets to then, you know, um, um, scale and globalize. So I think these kind of programs, um, and, and, and obviously, you know, um, in the last couple of days, right, um, two UK-based companies um, have been awarded um, about four million um, um, pounds, right, um, by the UK Space Agency to design, to design missions that are looking at, you know, this, this place of space debris and, and um, you know, um, um, innovate manufacturing and, 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 and satellite type capabilities. So, you know, I think, these kind of programs, it, it does take a few years, but, you know, um, with the will, um, you know, I think anything's possible um, for emerging space space um, ecosystems. Okay, thanks. Um, Bert, a, a housekeeping uh, question. We're, we're at the time limit. Can we have, uh, can we beg forgiveness and maybe go over five or 10 minutes? Or, or, or Fred or Larry? I think that they mentioned in the side chat that we're that we're good to keep going if we want to. Oh, a little bit. okay, there. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, yeah so I, 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 I trying to uh, 
really, the questions are pouring in. This is exciting. Um, uh, may, maybe one question uh, here that that we can address. Uh, whoever wants to, what's the best place for someone on the on the on the in the audience to? What's the best resource to find out more about the industry, and how they can get involved and maybe find out about more events like these? So that's that's a super broad question. Uh... I'll start with the easy one, finding out just about more events, more things to show up at. Um, if, uh, if, you, if you aren't on it already, I highly recommend getting on Twitter. Um, a lot of people have their, their own opinions about the Bird app, uh, but for one reason or another, the space community has taken to, the, to, to Twitter like crazy. It always has been. Um, everybody's on it, interns through executives, you know, news breaks before, you know, formal announcements, you know, you see great engineering and technical arguments, you see a lot of gossip and fighting and you know, anything and everything going on in the space industry is somewhere being discussed or exposed or broken down or analyzed or celebrated um, on Twitter. So Twitter is an excellent place to find some you know, latest papers, latest presentations, to learn about, you know, what new hot events are going on and what people are being invited to. Um, and also too, uh, what what talks are going on that are being live streamed that maybe you can jump in on that you wouldn't have known about. Great. Anyone else have good resources to share for folks? Yeah, absolutely. There's a, um, I mean, I would definitely, definitely head over to the Global Entrepreneurship Network, the space division we've got. I'm also on the board of advisors with Stefan and Brandon. And um, although there's a LinkedIn page that's formally um, newly been created. And so we're going to start posting some events that we have there specifically for entrepreneurs and business owners um, and those looking for a career in the space network. So that's a great place. Just look um, Gen Space on LinkedIn, but also the International Space Station Na National Laboratory. It's um, issnationallab.org. And so where you can find there is a group of um, commercial service providers and implementation partners to the ISS. So there's companies um, like there's 13 commercial service providers. Uh, Rhodium is one of them, BioServe, NanoRax. Um, there's that are main service providers to the ISS, but on that webpage, they have um, a lot of seminars that come up for research announcements, for funding opportunities, for the main conference ISS R&D. And it's, um, we recently just had it, it's usually every year in July. So that's a really good spot for all the researchers and technologists and engineers looking to connect with industry, the commercial side of space go to the ISS r and um, And one other one is ASGSR. So that's the American Society for Gravitational and Space Research. And there's a conference coming up here in the next month or so, but their website is geared towards professionals, those in the industry, and they're really good about having um, networking and outreach and hosting seminars. But definitely check out GenSpace. Thanks. Anyone else? Yeah, perhaps like uh, like uh, Olivia mentioned on on a, on a side that like uh, space conferences just like uh, Google to find like this all over the world and in US especially and for different purposes whether it's ISS uh, R ISS R and is it R and D or R C like I don't remember anymore. Well, these acronyms are like one thing that space industry need to some some point like learn to do better. But uh, uh, yeah, so definitely try to uh, join some of those and, and they will be great uh, uh, depending on your interest and what the topic of the uh, or theme of the conference to find people and uh, uh, meet ventures organizations and so forth building on that too yeah I, I I would highly recommend or I can't emphasize enough the value of volunteering um, you 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 find one event uh, maybe maybe it's ISDC with NSS. That was my very first space conference ever. I played hooky in high school, drove down to Chicago from Minnesota, went to ISDC back in 2010. That was great. Um, and, uh, you know, there are many other conferences out there as well in the space community. But whichever one you found, um, reach out to the organizers and see if you can volunteer. And in volunteering, you'll learn about the industry. You'll meet people. You'll get to show yourself off a little bit. You'll learn about other events. You'll get invited to help out with other things. Um, I, I, I attribute a lot of, you know, where I am and the network that I've built to all of the years that I spent 
volunteering with different space advocacy organizations in the conferences. Plus, it's cheaper to get yeah, into yeah, so, that way. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, usually they'll, they'll pay yeah. for your registration in your hotel and a variety of other things. Maybe not the flight, but a lot of other things. Yeah. Yeah, and one, once again, quickly adding to Brandon's, like, like of course, the community is like joining exactly uh, whether it's like National Space Society or, or Space Nation at spaceport.spacenation.org. And uh, uh, so it depends again, like uh, uh, where your passions lie, which part are you more technical, the human aspects of the space or, or what. So there's a lot to choose from. Yeah, um, I would say um, some pretty you know, super simple um, ways that I, at least I've, I've done in the past, um, let your email work for you. Um, so I would usually set up um, Google alerts, um, which basically scoured the, the internet for, for anything um, that pops up based on a keyword you've given, right? So whether it's space entrepreneurship or whether it's Artemis or whatever it is, right? Um, so you just set up a Google alert and you just get every day, right? A steady, a steady stream of things on that topic, right? Um, so wherever you are, whether you're super technical, or whether you're an enthusiast, right? You can basically get the things that, um, that's, that are being written across, across the web there. Um, newsletters, um, are definitely a great way to keep our press because all of that information in terms of, you know, um, any news within the space community, um, any nuggets, any events, um, you know, are, are put into a nice little package and sent every day. Um, so payload is one that, that I like, um, there are several others. And then, um, I mean, if you are an enthusiast and you want to connect with community, um, you know, and, and you're interested in, in innovation, there's obviously things like, um, the NASA space apps uh, challenge, right? Um, I know that's that's more of a fun innovation type. You know, get 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 your hands stuck in, and I mean, it's the largest space hackathon um, on Earth, um, and it's happening this weekend, right? Um, so I started the, the 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 first one in a couple of countries um, across Africa. So that's definitely something that I always um, advocate uh, to get into as as an enthusiast and wanting to meet other like minds and just get stuck in. Um, as well, so um, that's yeah. Tomorrow and and uh, and Sunday. That's great. Well, we have we have two minutes left, so I'm going to give you thirty seconds each to any closing comments. Um, uh, let's just start, uh, Olivia. Um, there is. Uh, I was able to see some questions, so I just want to make a note. I did answer those in the dialogue, the chat box. Um, but basically the questions we're asking, uh, the last one was interesting about have there been any studies on disease, diseases and illnesses? And yes, so microgravity is an excellent analog um, test bed for low dose radiation therapies, which is used in cancer therapy. So certainly cancer is a big, um, a big disease and, and big target area for utilizing the ISS in the space environment, but also um, looking at Alzheimer's disease and osteoporosis um, and microgravity, the bones, the density of the bones is less and less. So essentially you're advancing the aging process in microgravity. So it's a good analog to look at. Unfortunately for the astronauts, um, advanced expedited disease models um, in doing studies in microgravity versus having to test on subjects here on earth. So yes, absolutely. But, you know, keep in touch. Um, I put my email in the chat, those answers. And so if anyone has any science questions or, or um, wants to get involved, please contact me or our amazing moderator, Stefan. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Uh, Brandon, also, you have a quick question here in the chat, if you get a chance to take a look at it about uh, the Boy Scouts having a nuclear science badge, too. But any any closing comments? Or maybe, maybe I'll let you answer that one while uh, I'll get someone else to do a closing comment about that. Sure. Okay, Kali, any closing comments? Well, quickly, just a thank you, Stefan and National Space Society and being part, and thank you for the great questions. Um, yeah, maybe a final note that uh, uh, don't uh, be afraid, be bold as Olu say I said, and uh, if you think about like building a business, build it a business like uh, Brandon told that uh, 
is uh, self-sustaining ultimately that there's a real business model that it's not just like thinking to build a cool ca gadget that nobody needs or, or that it doesn't solve a problem and be uh, very conscientious of building an organization and team which you eventually need you cannot do everything yourself uh, in a way like olivia uh, mentioned that uh, uh, find uh, everyone's motivations and those are different for maybe a rocket engineer than for example a marketer and you need all of these when building a company or enterprise and uh, final note that like brandon said just get your foot on the door like between the door whether it's volunteering or, or interning so just go out there and, and uh, 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 do it thank you and have a great day everyone uh, shaya any closing comment um, yeah, I'll, I would build on um, on what I just said in terms of just being bold and push that door on your cre uh, curiosity. Um, I think for me, you know, uh, where, where where we see limitations in emerging markets, right? Um, we really ask what happens when you start participating and solving, you know, hard problems in space. You start solving institutional challenges back back on Earth, right? Um, so it's something that is not um, a nice to have; it's a must have, right? And so you will be doing things that are, are um, really needed, right, um, here on Earth. Um, we are a space-faring civilization, right? It may or may not be on Elon's uh, uh, time frame, but, you know, from a mindset perspective, right, we've really crossed some important thresholds, and, you know, um, everyone has to be um, part of that space-faring um, um, opportunity. So, so go for it. Great, thank, thanks. And, and Brandon? Uh, I'm typing out my answer back to, to William uh, right now, um, but uh, I can I can I can make a closing statement real quick. Um, you know I I, I I don't want this to sound discouraging. I want this to sound realistic. You know, space is a is a difficult place to do business if you're trying to, um, you know, introduce new technology, do a space for space style business. You know, if if you are um, really thinking about any model other than you know, telecommunications or a data relay service or something that, you know, goes to a microgravity environment and then comes back down. You know, I'm very, very, very excited about the business opportunities in, 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 in bio and biophysics and pharma and space-based agriculture and things like that. Um, but these are not traditional businesses. These are not traditional problems that are being solved. Um, you know, a lot of these technologies are being used in this environment for the very first time. And I'm just speaking broadly or generally here. Um, so, you know, don't underestimate the difficulty of doing business in space and really think hard about, um, you know, whether or not the business model that you're trying to conceptualize and put together um, needs space. Um, now, that being said, if you can check those boxes and figure that out and get yourself the right answers to those questions, by all means, you know, full steam ahead, go for it. It's a thrilling industry to be a part of. Um, the trick is uh, sticking around and building a sustainable business. Um, and, and, and maturing something past a startup, you know, the, the goal isn't to be a startup forever. You know, we, we all get very excited about launching startups and, and raising money. Um, that's just the beginning. You have to pay that money back, <laughs> 10X, to whoever, you know, invested that money into you. And, and they want that money back, you know, sooner rather than later. Um, and for you to do that, you have to mature your organization and you have to grow. Um, and you have to grow your, 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 your market reach as well, too. So think hard about your space business, why you want to do it, what you're going to do in it, and how it's going to grow. And uh, and, and when you're able to answer those questions for yourself, um, throw yourself in it. It's going to take everything you got. Thanks, Brandon. Well, thank you, uh, Olivia. Thank you, Shaya. Thank you, Kali. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, NSS. Thanks, Bert, Fred, and Larry. And, and thank you, audience, for, for participating giving us tons of questions. As you can see, we can do this in our sleep. We we do this probably in our sleep as well as we dream about the things that we think about in space and things we want to implement. So we thank you very much and we look forward to staying in contact with you. Again, please do reach out on us. LinkedIn is a pretty good venue for us as well. Yeah, please reach out. We'd love to chat with anybody more. Did we do okay, Bert, on timing? Sorry, we oh, went over. Perfect, thank you so much. <laughs> A, a quick question for Olivia. What's the latest on the Crew 5 launch? Is that still scheduled for next week? Scheduled for October 5th now. So um, I know space flight, uh, yeah, the launch websites aren't totally updated yet, but it is October 5th, still at about 1230 in the afternoon um, Eastern time. 
So yeah, sure. wish us luck, cross your fingers, and hopefully that we clean up all the debris. <laughs> okay, absolutely. Well, I just want to thank uh, our panelists, uh, you know, uh, Brandon, Zaya, Kelly, and Olivia, just fabulous information that you shared with us and your interest, your passion, your knowledge. Uh, it really elevated the discussion and provided us with a lot to think about. And hopefully we, we got through a lot of the questions. I know everybody, we can't answer everything, and, and, but we did go a little bit longer. So hopefully we covered as much as we could. Uh, I would also like to give a special thank you to, to Stefan for doing a, just a tremendous job in moderating and handling all the questions uh, and getting all this organized for us. Uh, and we look forward to continued collaboration with uh, with Gen Space. And uh, I've saved uh, the chat, so I can hopefully uh, share that with the panelists as well uh, as we go forward. And we look forward to uh, more updates in this area. I think it's just a just a fascinating uh, fascinating area that uh, we're going to hear a lot more about uh, as uh, we continue becoming a space bearing civilization. So as always, I would like to thank uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Fred Becker, uh, who handles our, our tech, and of course, my colleague, Larry Ahern, uh, as we continue to do the space forums. Uh, everybody, I'm just gonna share my screen one last time uh, as we close out for the evening. Uh, so again, uh, thank you for, for joining us tonight. Uh, I want to just remind you that our next session is in two weeks with uh, astronaut uh, Scott Altman. We'll be sending out the announcement soon, uh, so look for that, and we will get all the information out about the, this recording as well. So uh, again, you can view all of our previous space forums, or most of them, on the NSS uh, uh, channel on YouTube. Uh, so we'll be getting that information out. So well, thank you all for attending again. Uh, wishing you a, uh, a great evening for those in a different time zone, and especially uh, uh, Sayer coming from Nigeria. Thank you. Have a great day ahead uh, and a great weekend. Stay safe, everybody, and we'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you so Take much. Care. Thank you. Thank you.